Now that we've learnt the basic principles, let's see how they play out in history. In this episode, we will focus on two civilizations completely dominant in their time, ancient Rome and the modern West. We're going to show how biohistory can help us understand how both these civilizations rose and why the same forces that destroyed Rome are at work in the 21st century. Do you feel stressed when your car breaks down or when you've lost your job? Well, this is nothing compared to what people would have felt throughout most of history. Worrying about next year's crops and whether you're going to starve or freeze to death this winter. At its core, stress is a physiological reaction to emotional strain or difficult circumstances. But rather than being just an unpleasant burden, our response to stress is actually a fundamental building block that makes civilization possible. As we learned in the previous episode, Occasional stresses act as V-promoters, making people more warlike, cooperative in small groups, and increasing the birth rate. However, long periods of stress have another vital effect in that they rapidly increase the levels of C. In fact, the physiological effects of chronic stress are similar to other C-promoters. Societies that have the highest levels of C today, specifically Japan and the West, both experienced a rising level of stress which reached a peak in the 16th century. Symptoms of this include mass paranoia, fear and brutal punishment, followed by endemic violence, political instability and, interestingly, an unusual reverence for harsh authority. In both these parts of the world, sea rose fastest during this period, leading up to peaks in the 19th and early 20th centuries respectively. So what we have now is a curvilinear relationship between stress and sea. A period of extreme stress combined with the powerful sea promoters in belief systems such as Christianity and Buddhism drove sea to unprecedented levels. We call this the civilization cycle and it is the key to understanding what happened to the Roman Empire and what the future holds for us. Rome, which began as a small coastal kingdom in central Italy, showed signs of a rapid rise of sea very early in its history. During the 6th century BC, there appears to have been a period of chronic stress, which involved brutal, unstable political regimes and the assassination of several kings. Rome had inherited advanced cultural technologies from the Etruscans and Greeks, which combined with stress to create an unusually high level of sea. The resulting growth of impersonal loyalties allowed the Romans to drive out their king and become a republic in 509 BC. This was followed by the development of a strong code of laws and a legal system. Roman sea continued to rise until the 3rd century BC. At this time, most Romans were hard-working farmers who followed a strict moral code. They rigorously disciplined their children and viewed luxury with suspicion. The discipline of high C and the aggression of high V also made them effective soldiers, allowing them to conquer and absorb their neighbours. But as prosperity increased and stress declined from its 6th century peak, C began to fall. People became less interested in farming and the rules governing sexual behaviour and family patterns began to break down. People also became less interested in controlling their children and the birth rate began to drop. In other words, the very temperament that built Rome was being undermined by its own success. Rome continued to flourish for a time, partly because higher sea provincials were absorbed into the society, but in time, Italy as a whole began to suffer from declining sea. Eventually, the decline of sea began to undermine the impersonal loyalties that formed the basis of the Republic. This allowed various leaders to challenge the authority of the Senate, and in 27 BC, the Emperor Augustus established the Roman Empire. Augustus was acutely aware of the declining moral standards of the Roman people. He was also deeply concerned at the rapidly falling birth rate, which is also associated with a sharp drop in V, another consequence of prosperity. Augustus tried to enforce numerous laws to combat these changes, but not even the most powerful man in the world 
could have any noticeable impact upon the civilization cycle. As loyalties became more and more personal with Falling Sea, the last vestiges of the Republic faded into autocracy. Eventually, they became so personal that even a distant emperor could no longer command loyalty. This led to political fragmentation and the rise of private estates that refused to pay taxes. And eventually, the impoverished economy could no longer support the enormous weight of the empire. When Rome was sacked and the Western Empire ended, it was little more than a signpost along the road. By the 6th century, sea had fallen so far that even money had gone out of use, and evidence from shipwrecks suggests that trade declined by as much as 98%. The Dark Age that followed was a period of war, misery, disease, and population collapse. People often cite these political and economic changes as the cause of Rome's demise. However, biohistory suggests that it was a changing temperament of the people themselves that drove these developments in the first place. However, as this collapse was occurring, a powerful new cultural technology called Christianity had begun to entrench itself in the dying empire. And although it took a thousand years, sea rose and then surpassed the levels that it had reached in Roman times. People began to work progressively longer hours, trade recovered, and representative government re-emerged. By 1850, Western Europe had achieved a level of sea higher than any point in world history. The Victorian middle classes placed huge emphasis on the importance of the nuclear family. They rigorously controlled the behaviour of their children, beginning as early as the first months of life, and were so puritanical that it was assumed moral women felt virtually no sexual desire at all. This corresponded with the greatest technological and economic boom in human history culminating in the Industrial Revolution. A similar pattern emerged all over Western Europe and North America, leading to the global primacy of Western civilization. However, just as in Rome, this surge in prosperity led to the rapid undermining of C and V. As stress and V declined, Europe also lost its aggressive edge and colonial empires were dismantled. Birth rates plummeted to the point that by the early 21st century, Virtually no Western nation has a fertility rate above replacement. The fall of sea in the West has been equally dramatic. Scarcely a hundred years after the peak of sea in 1850, Western societies have largely abandoned Christianity, the cultural technology that underpinned Western civilization. Child rearing behavior has begun to shift from high sea discipline back towards the low sea indulgence of our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Over the past 50 years, the physiological changes that accompany declining V can also be seen in falling levels of testosterone and a declining sperm count. There has also been a sharp decline in the age of puberty, a result of switching off of the scarcity mentality associated with high C. Looking wider, we see that rates of innovation have already been falling for over 100 years. Real wages haven't increased since the 1970s, and since 2007, the economies of Western nations have stalled, with recoveries coming slower and with less certainty than in the past. So, are these merely short-term setbacks, or are they the warning signs that our civilization is heading for long-term decline? One common perception is that our technology has made us more or less impervious to serious social collapse. But on the contrary, it is the prosperity created by this labour-saving technology that may pose the greatest threat of all, as it undermines the very temperament our society is built on. Most attempts to deal with these issues have been framed in terms of government policy or economic management. But these have no power to affect the vast change in temperament that is the root cause of the stagnation. But what can we do about this? To start with, you need to decide for yourself whether the ideas presented here are cause for concern. Is our society heading in the same direction as ancient Rome? And could advances in biology be the key to understanding why? Today, epigenetic research is making enormous strides in understanding cancer and other life-threatening diseases. 
but very little has been done to understand how the epigenome affects our temperament and behavior. In the laboratory, we've made considerable progress in understanding C in terms of behavior, physiology, and inheritability, which helps us to update the theory of biohistory and inform the direction of future research. If you are a scientist, historian, or psychologist, feel free to contact us to find out how you can contribute. We could be on the verge of a great intellectual revolution that could have a profound impact on the future of our world, but we need your help to make it happen. To order the book or learn more about the Biohistory Foundation, please follow the link on your screen.